Um, my name is Derek Goldman, and I I'm, uh, incre feel incredibly uh, privileged to be part of this um, conversation uh, with um, uh, a group of people in our field, the theater field, who uh, um, uh, sort of, from where I sit, embody the kind of incredible uh, range and ecosystem of our field as uh, writers, theater makers, producers, developers of new work, directors, and thinkers. Um, these are people who, um, uh, who I kind of most admire and appreciate what they're up to in their own work and as uh, leaders and um, shapers of our field. So how exciting to have them all here in Washington in a theater space and in fact one of our most beautiful theater rooms um, I think in the country but certainly in Washington. Uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to be part of this. Um, just to let you know who's who and I'm gonna forego the longer introductions and let those things reveal themselves uh, as as we get into the meat of things because I know 45 minutes is is just a trickle, a taste of of, um, of, of, of what we could get at with these folks. Um, Christopher uh, Hidma from Sundance to my immediate left. Sorry, Christopher Hidma from Sundance to my immediate left. And talking to you, um, and Lisa Isaac, Cynthia Schneider, and Heather Raffo. Um, and I'll just make a couple of sort of uh, quick remarks about what I hope we will kind of get at and stir up among the group, and then uh, I hope folks will, um, will share their stories and insights and ideas uh, with us. I think it's just, number one, I would say it's just amazing and not taken for granted that theater um, is at the table in this conversation. I think sometimes we feel that theater is uh, a tiny bit of a poor stepchild. Maybe that's our own our own uh, issue. But it's kind of some of the issues in the theaters can stay uh, fairly hermetic or contained within the theater field. And one of our challenges um, is to uh, be at the table in bigger conversations about policy and politics and the work um, that different forms of media and different forms of art are doing in the world. And theater is, in fact, of course, doing extraordinary things all over the place, but it is often ephemeral and localized and live, and by definition, some of those things are harder to, uh, to share um, and uh, to um, disseminate. So to be part of this conversation and be really inspired by the earlier conversations is, uh, is is, is a great thing. Um, uh, I've been situated here in Washington at Georgetown, and let's we'll just say uh, we, my partner, our colleague Cynthia Schneider, and I have founded something called the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. And its mission, um, when I read the sort of uh, people who will be coming together and the charge of this panel, um, the mission of what we've been trying to do is basically to explore the question of how theater um, matters and operates uh, and connects with the world of uh, questions of policy and international politics um, and the challenges of that. And so, uh, again, this all feels, um, this all feels uh, incredibly resonant. I want to start with Heather, um, if I could. Um, and I'd love you to just tell us a little bit about your work, but then to get to what I think will be one of the central questions for, for our panel, which is um, you've been grappling as a writer and maker and performer with theater communicating across cultural divides. Um, and I think the, um, if you could talk to us a little bit about um, your experiences with, certainly with Nine Parts of Desire, but with your full body of work in terms of the challenge and the opportunity of, of communicating across cultural divides on stage. Hi. So I, I guess I'll start by saying we're in a theater right now, and I'm happy to be in a theater. I'm a theater artist, and I think this is really great. And I think what we learn from this is if we had this conversation over Skype, it would not be the same. Right? So when we're talking about seeing things in sound bites, or even just seeing things on the screen and connecting communities and how great and fortunate we all are. Myself, I'm an Iraqi American, so when I'm in a university in Iraq and I'm connecting those university students to American university students over Skype and we're talking, yes, it's fantastic. But we're having a different conversation because we're in the room together. 
and that's terrific. <laughs> I think it's a deeper conversation. I also think that it's why I still do theater, something we were talking about just backstage is, is, is theater not funded because once the theater is done, it goes away. If you make a documentary film, it lives forever. Another experience I have is I wrote a play called Nine Parts of Desire, so it's about Iraqi women, and it's been running for 10 years. So a couple months ago, it was playing in India and in Illinois. So okay, so th that's great. Yes, I should be so lucky to have a commercial success in the theater. But more than that, if I had made some sort of film only of this theater piece and that played in a classroom to teach these students about these Iraqi women, yes, it would be moving. Yes, they would hear things they've never heard anywhere. Of course, that's great. When I go visit the classroom and do one three-minute monologue, they feel like they have met an Iraqi. They have to look me in the eyes. They have to deal with me. I'm addressing them. And even if they're entirely uncomfortable, I don't really want to look at that actor. Who's that blonde being rocky? Even if they're doing all that, even that level of uncomfortable is engaged. They're dealing with me. That's the difference between live and everything else. So I'm a huge supporter of the live performing arts. I think that another thing I was really thinking about in our last conversation, because I was, I'm working with a couple Saudi and Egyptian women right now and telling their own stories and getting those stories to the stage somehow. Um, these are people that have never written before, never even live the theater, okay? So one of the things that crossed my mind when I was hearing about the, the tweeting, the beautiful, <laughs> that idea of people tweeting at midnight, one in the morning, and what those ideas of these Saudi women are. The other thing I'd like to ask is what's the difference between public and private? I know what Heather would tweet versus what she's going to say at one in the morning to the person in the room with her. So when it comes to my play Nine Parts of Desire, this was a decade's worth of private conversations with Iraqi men and women and me whittling down the things they will never, ever, 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 ever say out loud. And then acting that on stage. <laughs> for 10 years in front of, you know, large audiences and small classrooms, and seeing what people do with that. The theater is intimate, and it's vulnerable, and it's scary. I'm not saying that tweeting's not scary. I, mean, I get that that's intimate and vulnerable in, in another way, but this is, an, this is why we're all in love with what theater can do. And I think that that's a big, Big thing. Um, another thing I'm working on is an opera called Fallujah. So I'm an Iraqi American playwright and actress, and I worked extensively with a particular Marine who served in Fallujah and saw the worst of the worst. And another element of this intimacy is what stage does, is it puts this military Marine in, con in connection with an Iraqi American writer who, who has spent the last 10 years writing it from the Iraqi side. And we had to have an intense conversation. We had to have a vulnerable conversation. Then I had to translate that vulnerable conversation to the stage so that that could also be live for other <coughs> civilians and military. And you know, so th these are the kinds of things that, that I'm up to. Great. So let me pick up on that, that question of the extraordinary kind of vulnerability and intimacy and personal work that gets done in the theater and try to connect that to the questions of um, thinking about theater as all of the people here are as a global phenomenon, as an international phenomenon, working um, across cultures, circumstances, points of view, and, 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 and Sort of dynamic within that. I want to turn to Patrick, just to, uh, um, whose work has taken me, your work has taken me all over the world um, as, a, as a writer and director and theater maker, and you've just been in northern Iraq and Sudan and southern Sudan and just are here via Dallas now. So you have some fresh to talk a little bit about that work, but specifically I think about this, the, the dynamic then between the intimate and immediate and local vulnerable embodied work that theater does and the, the global picture, the international picture of these relationships. Thank you so much. 
Is this working or? Yes, yes? great. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks so much for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm a playwright who's been writing about human rights and uh, social justice for over 20 years. And I just had the opportunity in northern Iraq, which is in Iraqi Kurdistan, to have my play The Beauty Inside, which is a play about an honor killing, translated into Kurdish and performed by uh, performers in uh, Sulaymaniyah. And what was so extraordinary about this experience is that they uh, cut the play basically in half and they uh, performed it in, in a way that was completely surprising to me. I, I actually don't, obviously, I don't speak Kurdish, but to see what they did was a great example of uh, a cultural exchange. The woman who was playing the lead, who's embodying a 14-year-old girl, uh, who herself was a student who was 17 years old. She, her name is Sawan Khalid, and she is in her second year at the Fine Arts Institute in Sulaymaniyah getting a degree there. And <clears throat> I've never seen anything like this before. It was as if I traveled all this distance to find my character of Yalava. She was able to embody uh, physical action as an actress in a way that I've never seen before. So that was really, really exciting for me. Um, I feel like one of the issues that we are grappling with in theater, uh, which I noticed as I went on, uh, my next stop was to go to Sudan and South Sudan with uh, Christopher Merrill from the University of Iowa's International Writers Program. And one of the things that we noticed, and I noticed this also in Iraq, is in cartoon, you have people that are grappling with Arabic, and but of course they need to um, get translations into English for their work to have uh, more reach. And then in South Sudan, it becomes even more complicated because they want to change over to English, but a lot of people are writing in either classical Arabic or what they call Juba Arabic. And I see that with the young artists there, uh, the only uh, viable solution is going to be really jumping on board with, the, with online solutions and, and really trying as hard as we can to create exchange through anything such as Facebook. Um, there are a lot of writers in South Sudan who are now being published online. There's, a, there's an online publication called Warscapes, which is actually, I think, based in New York, that is really interesting. And so I think we're cre we are right now uh, 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 confronting a, the compromise that is going to have to happen, which is how can we create a network of theater artists and even just writing artists in general that can communicate in situations that are very, very dire. South Sudan, I, I think, is a, is a quite uh, dire situation. And so we want to hear from those people. And as a Theater Without Borders co-founder uh, with Roberta Levitao and, and Eric N, uh, I think we spent a lot of time trying to send each other we were talking about how many emails we send each other, uh, trying to send out word. I just saw a radio theater artist here in South Sudan. She's written like X amount of episodes of, of theater um, for radio. It's not getting produced. Um, we were interviewed in the South Sudan by a radio station called iRadio that is run by young people that is extremely uh, proactive in trying to engage the youth in that community. So I see that those are some of the solutions or, or some of the venues that are happening. Um, I just want to, oh, and I was going to mention Book Wings, which is something that, again, uh, the University of Iowa is doing. And I know Heather's written a short play for that. Um, this year, it's uh, interchange between Baghdad and um, Iowa. And um, I wrote a play, a short play called Mob Court, which is in fact about the, the, what happened in Fallujah that created the deformed babies. And these plays will be done by telepresence through, in both areas. 
So I will end with that and just also mention Culture Hub in New York City, which is a sister organization of La Mama as being another uh, organization to keep your eye on. Thank, Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, let me turn to Christopher. You've been thinking about these things and dealing with both uh, in your work with Sundance Lab, working with many of the leading playwrights and theater makers here in the, in the US, and then also the Sundance East Africa, spending time there. And so this question, I think, of, um, of cultural divides and, the, and some of the challenges and differences between the thinking that artists um, you know, you know, domestically are doing about political issues and in their own work and what you're seeing from, uh, from the work that you're involved in in Africa and how those things perhaps talk to each other. Um, uh, if you could share some of that, that would be great. Sure, sure. Well, thanks again. Uh, this is an amazing panel to be on, and to be in one of America's first and greatest regional theaters is a pleasure today. Um, at Sundance, the reason that we do uh, engage internationally is because we feel that Americans are so isolated from the rest of the world, sometimes um, uh, self-imposed isolation, right? And that when you put artists together in a room, that amazing things can happen. And we don't dictate what that thing is, which is the joy of doing my job. But when you uh, put a, a, a playwright from Rwanda who has written about her response to the genocide in with you know, a, a guy from Brooklyn whose who, uh, girlfriend just broke up with him, his story changes. And his writing changes. His art making is changed. And that's the whole reason why we do this. And so for the last 13 years, we've been putting people in the same room together from Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Burundi with artists uh, when we go out to Utah, to the Sinan's Resort, uh, and just see what happens. And that's really exciting. Um, I think one of the reasons that I, I'm so fascinated by the conversation here today is that we are beginning to wrap up our initiative in East Africa in a formal way and uh, move up into the Middle East and North Africa part of the world. And it's our goal to create a triangle of exchange between artists in the US working in theater, with those working in East Africa, and those working in Middle East and North Africa. And that conversation is so important for understanding. And uh, as opposed to having theater with a, one of the questions that's on our, on our agenda today was to talk about theater with a purpose. Um, at Sundance, we don't care what it is you write about. You could, uh, we are interested what's in your heart, what is the most important thing that you have to say right now in this part of your life, um, as opposed to saying we want you to write about clean water or domestic violence or whatever. And that's what I think is a, a wonderful thing about just putting people in a room together and see what happens. Then real change happens at a kind of cellular, cellular level. Great, thank you. And Denise, you've been building your own company, Nora Theater, and I wanted to pick up on that idea of theater with a purpose and have you talk a little bit about your experiences with Nora and that purpose. Sure, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I co-founded a theater company called Nora Theater. Um, it's in New York City, and we're a company in residence at New York Theater Workshop, which has been a fantastic opportunity. And the mission of the company is to support, develop, and present the work of artists of Middle Eastern descent. Um, and oftentimes people will say, well, I, uh, you know, I'm from, you know, I'm Egyptian American, but I have something and it's not, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with the Middle East. And we say it's no problem because what we've found is that there's this fantastic community of artists in New York and around the United States um, that are not represented well and they have something to say and they're directors and actors and playwrights and, you know, uh, our uh, agenda, I hate to use that word, but our purpose and our mission and our passion is to give these people a home and give these people a chance to hone their skills and give them the opportunity to tell their own stories because what we're responding to are stereotypes and uh, you know oh they're terrorists oh you know this that and the other thing in media and in entertainment uh, we have this joke sort of in our community um, you're all familiar with the television show homeland yeah. um, so uh, we have a lot of friends that go on that show and they die and that's what happens to them because they're terrorists and they got blown up or they got killed or whatever and you know we're, we're tired of seeing those renditions we're tired of seeing those portraits and I, I think you know one of the things that you guys wanted to talk about I think was well 
who has the right to tell these stories? Can any artist write about a Middle Eastern experience? And you know, my response to that is, yeah. Any good artist will do his or her due diligence and do their research and assemble a team of experts. But I think right now, and, and I want to see that work, um, but I think right now I'm so interested in what these artists of Middle Eastern descent have to say about their families, about their experiences. Did, you know, uh, and I think particularly Arabs in the diaspora, Middle Easterners in the diaspora, first generation, second generation, who straddle both cultures, really can, uh, can, can speak in a really interesting way. They have, the, they have the, the, the experience of being Americans and growing up here and they have their, their, their families, and they're still connected to their roots, and they want to talk about it. Can so, I just follow up and ask, is there a tension you find, and this I think relates to everybody's work, but is there a tension you find between the desire to communicate um, internally within one's own culture, meaningfully and authentically, and the desire in specific artwork or generally to communicate across those, or is it your sense that like if one does one successfully and with integrity, then is, is the goal important for these artists and writers in terms of defining that distinction, or does one take a leap of faith in a way and say, I, I have my story to tell, and I'm going to tell it the best way I can, and then it's a sort of separate process of figuring out who's, who's going to come to that, who's going to come to that, or how they're going to connect with it. You know, I mean, I think you need to have a little bit of both. You, 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 you might have a great story, and you might not tell it well, then you just don't want to listen to it. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, so it's, I, I think what you're asking is that you, you want that artistry, right? And you want, um, you want to see good work that you feel connected to, that you feel is universal, and you want those stories to be authentic. You want to hear, uh, like Christopher was saying, what is in this person's heart? What do they have to say about their culture? What are they tired of seeing out there? Or what do they want to celebrate? Uh, am I, am I yeah. sort of doing that? Um, so I, I think they are deeply interwoven. Um, and I think, again, too, you, you, we want those artists to succeed. We want them to go on. We want them to play arts to create canons of, of uh, you know, fantastic plays. And we want the actors to go out and uh, win Tonys and get out there so that there's exposure, so that they have opportunities to keep the conversations going, so that eventually, hopefully, that culture starts to change. That you know, when we, we put on a show, um, a show that I wrote called Food and Fud, while we cope, we oh, thank you, that's really nice. Thank you so much. Heather was in it. Um, also, she was wonderful. Um, and uh, we co-produced it with New York Theater Workshop a couple seasons ago. And you know, we wanted to tell this story that, that basically that just of the the play is that it's about this woman who lives in Bethlehem, and she sort of takes care of the family, and uh, they're under occupation in Bethlehem. And in order to sort of deal with her life, she pretends to have a cooking show. So she talks to the audience about her cooking show. Um, and what we got, we got a series of different comments about it, uh, and, and some of the positive ones were, man, I didn't know, I didn't know Arabs were funny, or I didn't know, uh, you know, that's wild. I'm like, I think they're hilarious. Yeah, and she's really funny. No, comedy, I think, it's something you've done, but I think comedy is a, is a huge game changer. Yeah. Right? And breaks through. In it just starts, way. and you're, that piece is an extraordinary example of that. that I've heard people seeing it and in the lobby having just very different kinds of conversations um, about connection and, you know, that seems to completely transcend, you know, their own sense of where they come from. And there were many things, with the kitchen and the cooking, there were many things about that piece that did that. That's certainly the comic. Thank you, thank you so much. And I think that's, so that's the hope, that, that people will go, the next time they see something on the news about Palestine or Palestinians or the West Bank, that, that they'll think back to the show that impacted them in a certain way because this character reminded them of their father who also died of Alzheimer's or whatever. And they'll, they'll, they'll reconfigure their mind and they'll, they'll say, oh, I understand. I understand these people. I, I, I'm going to look beyond what I'm seeing here. Um, really, I mean, essentially what I'm saying is they start to see people as human beings. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the point, really. Right. That and that's a great segue in terms of Cynthia Schneider, this idea of seeing people as human beings. You're sort of, um, as former ambassador and as a uh, uh, professor of cultural diplomacy, uh, sort of the representative on the panel from a little bit the other, the, the, uh, not, not working in the room artistically in the same way. But uh, if you could talk from your perspective um, about the work you've been involved with, um, uh, 
thinking about how how the arts and theater in particular can make an impact in policy circles. And I think it, I know it connects to this kind of question of seeing people as human beings. Thanks so much, Derek. Well, it's a great uh, privilege to be here with all these talented people. I am the classic example of those who can't do teach. So it's mm -hmm. wonderful that through Derek I get to be around all these talented people. And I owe a lot to Theater Without Borders and Roberto Levento. It was that conference you did in New York that really opened my eyes to international theater. And I know she teaches in, um, uh, for Sundance also. And I'm going to just, I have to just touch a little bit on the home end thing here before I answer Derek's question. I also uh, co-lead an organization called MOST, which stands for Muslims on Screen and Television. And we work with writers, producers, showrunners to give them information about any and everything having to do with Muslims and Islam with this goal that we're talking about, um, this goal of humanizing uh, instead of doing what politics do, which is demonize. There I'm quoting from the Nigerian novelist uh, Rolo Soyinka. But of course, you know, television and film in America, these are commercial industries. Their goal is not to uh, build bridges. Their goal is to make money uh, with good stories. And I will concede definitely that season two was pretty bereft of good stories. Every single Muslim character wanted nothing else but to kill people, no matter where they lived, what they looked like. Eventually, they wanted to kill you. But I will direct everyone to season three. Uh, season three has a fantastic character, Farah, who is an Iranian-American CIA agent. Um, and my organization most helped advise on creating this character. She's based on real life, and she is authentic and real. So everyone watch Homeland Season 3. Um, and they do not be me sick. Uh, Heather, I've been fortunate to have uh, a, a several years relationship with after seeing her incredible production here at the arena stage of Nine Hearts and Desire, which was just, for me, a transformative experience. And thanks to her friendship for, with Derek, we've been privileged to host her at Georgetown. And I wanted to give just a glimpse. I'll start with a micro and then briefly go to macro. I want to give a glimpse of what theater interacting with international relations can mean um, and I'm going to use uh, the example of an extraordinary class I held at Georgetown. I teach diplomacy and culture at Georgetown. It varies every semester depending on what's going on and who's around. Uh, that semester, my students had been lucky enough to see both the great game, the incredible cycle of plays about um, Afghanistan, and Blacklash about Iraq. But I didn't want them just to see this play about Iraq. I wanted them to understand what was that. You know, what were they seeing? Uh, and one of my students was married to a Marine. Uh, and so I got permission through his commanding officers to have him come into the class and talk about his experience. You know, he was the same age or younger than my students, who none of whom had any direct experience of a Marine serving. In fact, his wife, Donna, told me it was the first time that anyone had asked her about her experience as the wife of someone who served uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, even though know, it was the end of her second year. And as luck would have it, by extraordinary coincidence, Heather was in town that same day and kindly agreed to come speak in the class. And I said, well, I can squeeze you in in between I also had a State Department person who had worked with me in The Hague, who had actually been the person in charge, not in Fallujah, but somewhere else during an attack. So we, I was to squeeze you in, and I give you 10 minutes. It was terrible. But um, here's what happened. Lalo spoke in that class for the first time about his experience. He'd never spoken about what his experience really was. And he gave first a kind of whitewashed version that sounded like, for example, in Afghanistan, all they ever did was drink tea. And, you know, and I said, there must have been something else. And for the first time, he said three men in his command had been killed. Then Heather did her incredible, just, you know, from sitting here and suddenly 
you are in Iraq, you are one person, um, and then you are another person. You are completely there in their lives. And for my students, suddenly this was not an abstract thing anymore. It wasn't about the body count or whether we were achieving our objectives. And all. It was about what it was doing to these people's lives what it's doing to the Americans' lives, and what it was doing to the Iraqis' lives. And that is not, I'm sorry to say, the way we conduct foreign policy. Uh, and you just have to look at what people are saying about Iraq now. Well, we're, saying, we're out. We're, we're out of Iraq. The whole world's supposed to be thrilled about that. I'm not suggesting that more Americans should be killed. But you just have to look at what we have left behind in Iraq and understand a little bit that the whole world isn't thrilled. Now, we might be thrilled, but the rest of the world is not talking about that because we met our deadline. In that class, you know, the students saw these conflicts through human eyes. An amazing connection was made between Heather and Lalo, and now they are in touch, and he's actually a part of her opera, Felicia, uh, and she's formed a wonderful friendship with him and his wife, Donna. Um, but the students experience this humanization. And I think on a broader level, what it means is that the really important work that these theater artists are doing in different parts of the world, really engaging issues on the ground, not necessarily you know, Americans coming and telling people what to do, but giving them the tools in the case of actual plays or in the case of mentoring and production and uh, other kinds of advice. And what they are doing is helping to leverage local voices. And I think this is the most effective path for diplomacy. Mm. Not us going there and telling people what to do, but facilitating expression by the local voices. Because these are the voices, you know, we forget we tend to marginalize artists in the United States generally and in diplomacy almost beyond belief. And, and yet, the artists are the ones in every society who are pushing the envelope, who are the canaries in the coal mine. They're the ones advocating for freedom of expression. So what I hope will happen, and what Derek and I in our own little way are gonna try to do from the very fortunate position of Georgetown, is to bridge this gap between practitioners of theater and practitioners of diplomacy so that they can both learn from each other. Thank you. Let me, uh, the time is cruelly short, and I want to, something that, that um, I think connects what all of you are talking about, that connects to one of the larger things here, theater in a digital age, and it has to do with where Heather started about us being in the room and on liveness, and the idea of witnessing, and theater as a space of witness and a testimony in a very particular way. Um, and theater, I think, in, in both its relationship between audience and performance, but also among the artists making it, is in a process of really redefining and rethinking what it is and what the terms are. There are different tools to bring into the theater, um, and there are different kinds of relationships on the front end between the artists making the work and all of these folks that are involved in that. So just to, to in this space of, it's you know, designed after the art, in some ways after our ancient spaces of witnessing and testimony, to sort of put that out there in the context of the digital age. Heather, you wanted to say something, and then I think we may have time for, for, for just to open it up to one or two questions. I just wanted to say briefly in this, in this way that art can affect public policy, only because I, mm. I I thought it was really interesting to be in this exact theater complex on the, this one stage yeah. over in 2006 and have, have an audience full. And when we did a talk back after Nine Parts of Desire, it'd be like 500 people staying for a talk back. And I'd have, I, I, I distinctly remember a man from the Pentagon, all like six foot three, weeping in my arms backstage and just holding on to me saying, I had no idea. And two feet behind him was an Iraqi woman who was particularly short. And it was just that sense of they're both like bawling. And I thought that this is really interesting to me that this man from the Pentagon who has the information, right, is saying he had no idea. What he meant is these human beings I just witnessed tonight, oh my God, do you know what I mean? And right behind him was this woman and they, I just wanted them to talk. 
And why not the sense in 2006, because it was the midterm election, and there's so many people from the State Department, the Pentagon, that came to see the show. It's, it's an interesting way of making a conversation, something live, rather than the information one's going to go out and get. And um, are there mechanisms that they announce? We have post-show discussions, but in terms of that challenge of getting them to talk, do you have any thoughts on, I mean, they're doing it implicitly, but I feel like that's maybe a shared that moment, you know, the getting them. Yeah, I mean, I think, but, that, but that is but also what I find interesting. If you're in the theater, you're sitting next to somebody, you have to experience this together. When you're at home taking in the information, or even in a movie theater, the ex expectation, even at the best movie, is it's dark and I will walk out. And maybe you're going to talk to the person you came with, right? At the theater, you're literally, you, you have, in, at least in D.C., it was, it was inner city high school students said, sitting next to, you know, policymakers, sitting next to Iraqis, sitting next to the, the Iraqi ambassador. Like, it was, it was everyone. And I think that when we would have these post-show discussions, they would, they would start elbowing. And people would start chiming in on all their points of view. And I think that, that, that it was a live event. Plus, you, you just pick up on the energy. You know if the person next to you is deeply uncomfortable and like that, or is leaning in. You know, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting times to see the family from Fallujah at Champaign-Urbana watching Nine Parts of Desire in the round next to entirely college students. And all the college students were watching the action on stage, and because it was in the round, were watching the family from Fallujah. You know, that's, that's an experience. Great. I think we are at time, unfortunately. I want to just say, this is just the, the feels like so the tip of the iceberg, but I want to uh, thank everybody. What an amazing group of thinkers and theater makers here. And I, I really appreciate being given this space of this theater. And I hope folks will continue to think about the liveness and the immediacy and the intimacy of theater making as kind of an integral part of, um, of these larger conversations. Thank you all so much.